So on, on the first part, I'm going to go ahead and read. I'm talking about unsanctified commitments, and I'm going to read a long piece of chapters here. I want you to listen to the story. I may make some comments in the middle of that. And uh, um, so I want you to notice the bookends. Notice how it starts. Notice how it closes. And you'll see what's in the middle. So here we go. Joshua chapter 9. I'm in the New King James Version. Um, what's happened historically, just for immediate context, is the people of God have crossed the Jordan River. They have taken Jericho according to the Lord's command, the commander of the Lord's army fighting for them. They have taken Ai with a failure in the midst of that. And God redeemed that. They have cut covenant. They took Ai in Bethel, actually. And then they cut covenant at Mount Shechem, or excuse me, by Shechem at Mount Gerizim. And now the Gibeonites who live about eight miles from Bethel and Ai are literally worried about what's gonna happen to them next. So here we go, chapter nine. It came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, that would be east of the Jordan River, in the hills and in the lowlands and all the coasts of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard about it. What they'd heard about was the collapse of Jericho, the miraculous crossing of the river, the fall of Ai, the fall of Bethel, and the covenant that was read in the central part of the nation, and they heard about this. Verse three, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we've come from a far country, now therefore make covenant with us. By the way, even though they took cities, these city-states, and destroyed a stronghold, they came back and camped at the place of Gilgal, the rolling away of reproach, and the place of covenant. They said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? And so they said to him, from a very far country, your servants have come. They're lying about this in case you're not aware. Uh, because of the name of the Lord your God, for all you have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who is at uh, Ashtaroth. And therefore, elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, take provisions with you for the journey and go to meet them and say, we're your servants, now therefore make a covenant with us. This bread of ours, we took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you. But now look, it is dry and moldy. These wine skins which, wine skins which were filled were new. And see, they are torn and these are our garments and our sandals have become old because of the very long journey. Isn't it just like the enemy to try to deceive us to make a covenant when they're actually targeted for extermination, when the enemy needs to get out of our life, they try to make a covenant with us. And it's by deception that he walks in and says, hey, we're your friends. We're from a far country. Don't kick us out. And this is kind of right there. Great deception. Now listen to how they respond, Israel. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions. In other words, they're smelling the bread and the mold but they did not ask the counsel of the Lord. Uh-oh. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them and let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. In other words, they said, we will, a covenant in those days will defend you, will honor you, we're committed. Your life for my life, a covenant was a very, very serious commitment. Was this a good covenant or is this a bad covenant? Probably a bad covenant, all right. Verse 16, it happened at the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were neighbors who dwelt near them. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day. Now the cities were Gibeon, uh, Chephirah, 
Beroth and Kirith Jerim, but the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel and all the congregation complained against the rulers, the leaders of Israel. Then all the rulers said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live lest the wrath of God be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. And the rulers said to them, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for all the congregation as the rulers had promised them. Then Joshua called for them and he spoke to them saying, why have you deceived us? We are very, saying we are very far from you when you actually dwell near us and in the land. Now therefore you are cursed and none of you shall be freed from being slaves, woodcutters and water carriers for the house of God. So they answered Joshua and said, because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land um, from before you. Therefore, we were very much afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now here we are in your hands. Do with us as it seems good and right to do to us. So he did to them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel so that they did not kill them. And that day Joshua made them woodcutters and water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord in the place which he would choose even to this day. Chapter 10, verse 1. Remember it started, all the kings, and it named a bunch of them in the south, were angry and started to marshal themselves for war. The Gibeonites see what's going on, decide we're going to deceive, we're going to cut a covenant because we don't want to get kicked out. We don't want to get killed. Chapter 10, and though they came to pass when Adonizek, the king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he'd done to Jericho and its king, so had he done to Ai and its king. And now the inhabitants of Gideon had, Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. They feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all the men were mighty. Therefore, Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Horam, king of Hebron, uh, Purim, or Piram, excuse me, king of uh, Jarmut, uh, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, come up to, to me and help me that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with all the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, king of Jarmut, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up they and all their armies encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. The men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal saying, do not forsake your servants. Remember, they're in covenant now. Come up to us quickly, save us and help us for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I've delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Notice the Lord's given instruction on this. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes from Beit Haran and struck them down as far as Zekah and Makadah. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent from Beit Haran that the Lord cast large hailstones from heaven as far as Ezekara and they died. And there were more who died from the hailstones than from the children of Israel who killed with the sword. So, what do I want to do with this? Unsanctified commitments. You realize they made a commitment that God had not authorized. I want to just kind of rehearse why we're having this battle. Kind of rehearse the story just a little bit with you. If you recall, um, just looking at, I'm sort of starting in Genesis, working my way to Joshua in about a minute, 30 seconds, something like that. Uh, Adam and Eve fell, they believed deception of the devil, and they took matters into their own hands and were cast in the Lord's presence. 
And then God, by the time of Noah, the sin is so perpetuated that he judged the earth. And then there were, um, after that, Noah came and there were 70 nations that were scattered because the still, sin still came with Noah. And so God chose Abraham and said, through your family, I will make covenant. You'll be a kingdom of priests and I will send you into the land of the Canaanites. And the reason for that was Canaan was the son of one of Noah's three sons that uncovered his father's nakedness. And he was cursed back in Genesis. Uh, after the time of Noah in Genesis 9, he was cursed. And um, when the nations were scattered, Canaan was singled out as a place that would be full of iniquity and sin. And God said to Abraham, I'm gonna bring you into that land, but I won't do it for 400 years, four generations, because the sin of the Canaanites has not reached its full measure. What you need to know about this is God will judge sin when it's to its full measure. Prior to that, there's a time of mercy and a time of waiting for people to repent and turn. And so Canaanite nations, the Amorites, Hittites, all of that's the land of Canaan. Their sin had reached a full measure. They were held off from that time so that God could be just and justified in judging that nation, driving them out and giving it to the people of God. Now, what I wanna say about this, this is a picture of your life and mine. The Old Testament is a picture in the physical of what's the spiritual reality in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Christ is forgiven sin, so we, we start with a clean slate, which is amazing. But when we get saved, the Lord wants to drive strongholds of sin that reside in our life out. That's the picture of these cities, these kings, these strongholds. And he says, I want them out of your life because if you permit them to stay there, they will become a snare to you. And they will cause you to worship other gods. They'll take you away from me and they will lead you astray. So you need to deal with those strongholds. So that's kind of the background of what we're dealing here. And there's a prophetic picture. And so the command of the Old Testament was to drive out the enemy dispossess them and take what is granted to you so that you might inherit the fullness of the promises. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking of our intercessory prayer beforehand. The heart of the Father, because I'm about to share seven things in Joshua that um, are part, wrapped around this unsanctified commitments. Um, and the heart of the Father is, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then Ephesians 2, verse 10, talks about the fact that we are God's workmanship, the word poeo in Greek, which means his creative masterpiece or poem, created for good works in Christ Jesus that he prepared in advance for us to walk in. What that's saying is your life and mine have eternal purposes of good works that before time began, before you were even in your mother's womb, God said, this one will do that. And the father loves you so much that he will pay any price, including his own son, to rescue you from bondage to the world system and bring you into the land of promise. And he jealously is watching over you to make sure that nothing will cause you to not enter in the first place and once you're in, to actually default on that and not fully possess. So we actually have seven things that can prevent you once you're actually into your promise from fully possessing. It's listed in Joshua. A couple weeks ago, I preached out of uh, Joshua 7 and I discussed 10 strategies of the enemy. By the way, who's the enemy? It's the devil and his cohorts. And it could be that external now because the body of sin according to Romans 6 has been washed away from me. I'm a saint, not a sinner, but it still tries to get back in and it still tries to cause me to walk in unrighteousness. And I can be tempted away by that external voice or I can be tempted away by Satan. Satan did that to Adam and Eve, but James is very clear, it can be our own lust that causes us to fall away. So that can prevent us from coming in. I won't review those 10, but in the book of Joshua, there's seven strategies. You ready? Here they are. First one's this. It won't take long because we've already covered this. In Joshua 7, there's the inner temptation to covet and act upon what does not belong to you. 
but it belongs to God or others leading to sins of disobedience. In this case, Achan coveted the things that God said, do not touch. But he coveted it, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, the lust of the eyes, right? The lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life caught his attention and he took willfully that which did not belong to him. God says, in this first city, it all belongs to me. And he took, took that and he hid it in his tent. And that's the issue with coveting and acting. We typically hide what we know is displeasing to the Lord. John 3 talks about that. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, men love the darkness and they flee from the truth of the light because their evil deeds will be exposed. And the challenge is when you actually hide something, it gives power to the darkness and it actually begins to rule over you. So it ruled over Achan. And as you know, when we did that sermon, it cost him his, his family, it cost him his life and his family. We discovered that sin like that has corporate consequences. So we just agree right now, Lord, that anytime we are tempted to covet maybe what another church has, what another marriage has, what we see with our eyes, the greed that we have for something, we will not act on those things. We will honor you because we know that we will not take what does not belong to us, but will only do what your word authorizes. Amen. By the way, our culture is running to things that they lust after without restraint. Number two, moving in human zeal for the, the Lord's purpose with human reasoning, pride, or presumption of God's blessing. They actually thought they were gonna take AI. Oh, um, just give us 3,000. We'll just take this. The Lord was so successful for us in Jericho. We don't even need to inquire of the Lord. Let's just take 3,000 minutes, a small city. We got this. That presumption, because of the sin that was in the camp, not inquiring of the Lord, cost, what was it? 38 men, I forget, that died on the, the way back in the first loss. So they moved in zeal and presumption, we've talked about. Here's the third and the fourth. What we're seeing here is there is covert, open covert deception of unsanctified alliances or commitments that are being presented to the people of God. And let me just give you some examples of what this might look like. Um, Unsanctified means it's not under God's holiness. Um, and the first picture of this is God says um, that he's going to judge the fullness of the sin that we still carry. Thanks be to God for Christ who removes that sin. In the Old Testament, we've got this picture of the sin of the Canaanites were at full measure. So God says you can drive them out. The second picture is this. God says, I will send my hornet before you and I will drive out the nations before you and give you victory and deliver you, but you must be careful to not make an unsanctified covenant with them. Let me read you some of the scriptures. Exodus 23, verse 31. This is in Mount Sinai. This is how the Lord says it. I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenants with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will certainly be a snare to you. Exodus 34, take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images for you shall worship no other God for the Lord your God is a jealous God. And it goes to say that if you permit that, your children will play harlot with their gods. It affects your family. Here's the New Testament take on something like this. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belalel, which is a name for the devil? 
Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell amongst my people and walk with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So this command to not make a covenant with sin is not only an Old Testament promise or command, but it's New Testament. You can't play, just some examples of what this might look like. You can't coddle any longer your orphan spirit because it will cause you to lose your identity and not be able to step into what God says about you. And you can't afford to tolerate those sin patterns that have become strongholds in your life because they will erode your effectiveness and they'll keep you from the fullness of what God has. Right now, there's incredible grace for those strongholds to be dealt with. You can't give in and coddle anger. Oh, well, I'm just a person that's hot under the collar. You can't give in to offense. Well, you, you don't understand, Pastor. So many people have offended me. Of course, I'm offended. You can't tolerate unforgiveness in your heart because it's gonna cut off the grace of God from flowing into your life. You can't let shame and insecurity and or curses that have been spoken over you or the bullying of the past prevent you from coming into the future. The problem is we coddle those and we tolerate the sin and they negotiate really well with us. Oh, you know that lust that you have, that's just normal for every every male or every man, whatever it is. It's just normal behavior. It's okay. You can just kind of manage that. It won't, it won't bother you. Make a covenant with me not to kick me out. Oops. Or or that greed that you have for finances, that insecurity around that, make a covenant with me and do everything you can to actually provide for yourself with your own hands, with your own effort, rather than trust in the Lord. Because you actually need to do that. If you don't take care of yourself, who will? Deception, deception. Do you hear where I'm going with this? We cannot coddle those strongholds. This is what's at stake with the Gibeonites. Oh, we're from afar off. And, you know, it won't hurt you to make covenant with us. Actually, God had said in in Deuteronomy 20 that if there's a foreigner that comes, you're to actually treat them mercifully. You won't kill them. And you can offer them peace which means they'll be your servants. And if they say yes, we'll give you peace, then they can become your servant, i.e. serve the kingdom. But if not, get rid of them. But those in the land I'm giving you, tolerate none of it. Get rid of everything. So in other words, I'm tolerant of my friends that don't know the Lord or that have a bad influence. But if they won't let me be who I am in Christ and won't make peace with the covenant that I carry with the Lord, I have to deal with it. But anything in my life that emerges that's a residue of the old nature that's no longer, I'm no longer defined by because I'm a saint, not a sinner. I gotta, deal, I gotta say, God, by the power of Christ, deal with it. Do you see where I'm going with this? The fourth thing that's here is God's people and leadership failed to seek the Lord's instruction. Did you hear how it said that very explicitly in the text? They actually used their human reasoning to say, oh, the bread's moldy. Their their shoes have worn out. Something tipped over. The tea. Whoa, maybe there's uh, something coming from John in the front row. Maybe I touched it. I don't know what I did. Shh. (laughs) <laughs> more Lord, yeah. <laughs> Great leaders inquire of the Lord. They don't just do what seems rational and the logical solution before them. How many of you know that sometimes you're tempted to just do what you know, what seems right, because it's, the Lord's command was take the entire place. And yet this deception came in about, hey, make a covenant with me. And they didn't inquire, Lord, are these from a distant country or are they not? Is this a good covenant for me to make or not? 
By the way, could you apply this to dating relationships? Could you apply this to a job? You don't want to get in stared with a job that's doing immoral practices. Could this apply to a number of situations? Absolutely. So the, the issue here is the text highlights quickly inquire of the Lord. Interestingly, in scripture, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, there's eight times David inquired of the Lord and he had success. Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Yes, I've given them into your hands. Boom. And Lord, shall I go up? No, this time you won't go up, but you'll wait for the sound of the armies of the Lord over the sound of the balsam trees. And then you'll circle around and do this and I will give you victory that way. And the two times David did not inquire of the Lord, he fell into an ensnared commitment with the Philistines and his wives were, and his, the wives and children of all of his men were taken captives at Ziklag. The second time is he didn't inquire of the Lord and he numbered the army at the close of Chronicles and it cost him. When God's people inquire of the Lord, they have favor. Let me give you, by the way, Jehoshaphat, this massive army coming against him, um, inquires of the Lord and gets delivered. But there's a place, um, and we've got people all throughout scripture. Rachel inquires of the Lord about the two twins wrestling in her womb, and the Lord gives her specific instructions. The older shall serve the younger. And you have twins who are both leaders of great nations. This would be the two boys that came. And of course, Jacob being the younger, the favored one. Um, interestingly, uh, the sons of Israel in the battle in Judges 20 inquired of the Lord, what should we do in our fight? And the Lord gave victory when they inquired. So I would just argue with you, it's time to inquire of the Lord. And when you don't, you position yourself for a problem. And I actually feel this prophetically for 2024. It's going, uh, we, 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 we talked about this in our staff. We got some significant revelation. It's gonna be a banner year for many of you of coming into inheritance. A banner year. But the Lord had a caution with that. You must ask me, because there will be lots of opportunities. What am I authorizing? And what are you to step into? It's a really clear word. We just were sobered by that. We even brought um, our, the former lead of our prophetic ministry, Rick Mann, down to just kind of consult with us. Is that tea for me? Thank you. On this issue, we really felt like he said, it's a banner year, but all your yeses need to be weighed with the Lord first. Otherwise, the devil will send something that looks like a great option, but it's an unsanctified choice. And you'll fall into it with logical reasoning because it looks good. Do you realize it would have been easier to make a covenant of peace with the Gibeonites than to fight a battle? And most of us, if we're really honest, if we don't want to battle with our sin issue and it offers us peace, we're like, okay, I'm tired of the fight. Can't do it. You inquire of the Lord and ask what he wants you to do. He'll give you the strategy. He'll tell you when. He'll tell you how. The other thing that happens also in this same text, if the enemy cannot take you out by um, taking things that don't belong to you or by presumption or by failing to inquire of him, there's various things we've talked about, or by making a false covenant, he will go with a full out frontal assault. He'll marshal the troops, every stronghold in your life He'll trigger all of them at once and try to take you out. Yeah, have you, have you all seen this? Like you got these victories, it's awesome. We just took two places and the next thing you know, you're getting hit from every side with a full out assault and that's the strategy. Nehemiah had the same thing. And you remember, this is a pattern in scripture. The, the Nehemiah thing was, Oh, well, let's, we're the people of the land. Let's make a covenant with you and we'll help you build the temple. And he wisely said, no, the Lord says I'm to build it and I'm not to make a covenant with you. I will not come down to you from this great work I'm committed to. So then they assaulted him with discouragement, threats of attack, 
All those kind of things to try to dissuade him from his call and Nehemiah did not bend because great leaders listen to the Lord, not the circumstances around them. So yeah, you might get a full out frontal assault, but here's the deal. No weapon for fashion against you shall prosper. Let's read that so you get it out of Isaiah 59. What is it? 54, 17. There's also one in um, 59, 21. So I'll read both. 54, 17. Let's find it. Ooh, these Bible scholars. Ooh. Awesome. <laughs> Guys, read your scriptures. Awesome. All right, let's read 54, 17. Here it is. Oh, let's read 16 to get it in context. Behold, I've created the blacksmith who blows coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. I have created the spoiler to destroy. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. In other words, I've let the devil test you and come against you, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world and you're being trained to reign with me and you will be an overcomer of that which comes against you. Does that make sense? Great scripture, thank you, Roger. Here's Isaiah 59. Verse um, when the, 19b, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The redeemer, sounds like Christ, will come to Zion and those who turn from transgression, Jacob says for the, the Lord, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit that's upon you shall not depart from your mouth or your children or your children's children. So it's this idea, if you get a full out frontal assault, it's part of the Christian package. Peter, Peter, Satan's demanded to sift you as, as wheat, but good news, I prayed for you, and when you're restored, tend my sheep and lead the church and be an act two person that launches everything. So, revelation, those churches, to him who overcomes, I give you the crown of life, or the white stone with a new name on it, or the various issues of heaven. So, part of it is, you need to realize you're in a war right now, and the enemy of your soul wants to have strongholds do raiding parties on your life. And he wants you to have false covenants with your, well, I sure hope none of you are addicted to like Instagram or Facebook. It's probably a not a good covenant. <laughs> Another church or eating disorders or sexual addiction or, you know, the list goes on and on. Don't make covenants with those things. Now here's the good news. The Redeemer has come to Zion, which is the name of the stronghold of the Lord. He is the commander of the Lord's army. Our eyes are fixed on him, the author and champion of our faith, because he is the one who delivers. He's the one who saves. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in your weakness. I'm still on part one. Um, we'll cover the next two in a couple weeks. Failure to drive out the sin and iniquity and ungodly alliances in your life. Joshua 13 is gonna start listing, but these people failed to drive out these people, and these people failed to drive out, and you know what? It became a snare. Before you know it, it's judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They got ensnared by the issues that they'd not dealt with. How many know that the inner healing issues that you need to deal with can keep you from the promises God has. Or those pet sins that you think are kind of manageable. And then we'll do it in Joshua 20, but there's a miscommunication and an offense which nearly divides the nation and they nearly destroyed themselves. Do you know most church splits and failures are over miscommunication and offense amongst leadership? If you can't get you to sin and immorality or in unbelief or in false compromises and the frontal assaults don't work, you'll start to try to divide your marriage, put offense and opinions in your heart and try to create a division and a dividing wall to separate you. 
Okay, what do I do with this? Um, Lord, I thank you that we're above these seven strongholds because you are our crown, you are our victor. You are our author and champion of our faith. You have saved us for good works, which you prepared in advance, and we will set our eyes upon you. We just thank you, Father. We just declare we will walk in fullness and that nothing shall prevent us from walking in all that God has. Neither height nor depth, nor angels nor principalities, nor any created thing shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus and his love died for me so I might walk in knowing the Father and the fullness of why he created me in the first place. Amen. Part two, I'll do this quickly. Can deception be redeemed and turned for our good? How many of you have been deceived at some point? <laughs> or betrayed? Or I mean, how many ways do we say it, right? Um, does it feel good? Do you feel angry when you're betrayed and deceived? Here's my big idea with this. How we respond when we fall prey to deception determines whether God can and will redeem it for our good. <laughs> if you fall in, unbelie- in, in um, unforgiveness, if you fall with anger and or abuse to that situation or cutting off relationship, guess what? You don't only cut off their promises, you cut off yours. <laughs> the good news here is they respond well. They should have been really angry at these guys and said, we're gonna take you out. By the way, when David almost did that with Nabal, Abigail came and said, do not incur the Lord's wrath. She wisely approached him and said, and the Lord dealt with Nabal. He dies, he gets the woman anyway. I mean, it's like, because he didn't serve, he, 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 he deceived, he didn't serve David. And David almost rose up in anger and, and disobeyed the Lord. Joshua could have done the same. He said, we're gonna wipe you guys out for that deception. So I got a couple of principles with this. Um, I'm not gonna read these texts. We've already read them. Um, the stage was deal with all the sin in the land, drive it out. But if a foreigner comes you can, and you offer them peace, take it, but make them servants to you. But here in Joshua 9, the bait is taken. And here's what it looks like. The deception that you and I face today is part of a fallen world. It's at the heart of the enemy's plan to derail us. It's, it's, it's what was in the garden. Oh, it's okay, you can do that one more time. It's like if any of you have been on diets and it's like, mm, that chocolate cake looks good and you know you're not supposed to eat it, but you just like, oh, I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> now that's... that's no, it's not relatively harmless. It could affect your A1C and your waistline, but um, there's a lot more things that are much more serious that the Lord goads you into looking at. So it's part of the fallen world that we face and we, we see it all around us. I've watched it with so many people where the enemy will bring up an option that's not a good option and say, look, it's good for food, it's pleasing to the eye, and it's useful for making you full, wise, fulfilled. That deception of the enemy always fails. You, doesn't fail him. So it's part of a fallen world. The second is it's really subtle, and it comes when we're under pressure, often have strong desires for something to happen. So we can actually create idols. Do you realize you can actually so want something, it becomes an idol in your heart and you hear through your idol and you think the Lord has said yes when he really hasn't. Yep. Hearing the Lord is not through the eyes of an idol. It's through absolute surrender and complete surrender to him. It's, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me laying down those desires so that we can hear clearly. How many of you felt like you've heard something, but you realize it's really your desire and it's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's really subtle and it comes in a lot of ways. 
I also want to just highlight, why did they fall? They did not inquire of the Lord. So here's your first principle of how to deal with this deception. Lord, do you want me to take that mission trip I was just invited to? Lord, do you want me to take that job I was just offered? Um, Lord, do you want me to date that person that just invited me on a date? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Or you're in a, a meeting where you want to encourage someone and you just have natural ideas how to do it. And you just choose to surrender that and say, Lord, I know what I'm thinking, but what is your desire for this situation? It's just so subtle, but that is your first place. We saw the error, we won't do that. Can we infer there's some other reasons? I wrote a few of these down. Um, we often want to believe the best in people. Oh, those Gibeonites, well, they kind of look like they're strangers and vagabonds. It's called unsanctified mercy and unsanctified compassion. It's like you have this human compassion and you wait too long even though the Lord's spoken and you just want to ignore that voice because you, you want to believe in people or you want to believe in the situation and you wait too long. Has that ever happened to any of you? Or am I like the only one that fights these, any of these battles? What about um, we want to avoid conflict and difficult issues and find an easy way out? Oh, I'll just not address that. I'll just make peace with that. And I'll kind of bury that even though it's eroding my marriage. I'll just kind of sit on that because if I bring it out to the forefront, well, it might be ugly. How's that working for you? <laughs> I, it's just so subtle. So Lord, I just pray you'd expose all these places. <laughs> really help us to move. Um, we're often ha attracted to the hidden good. The devil makes it look really good. He really does. Sometimes they're unavoidable. So there's lots of reasons. And how can we avoid it? I want to just submit to you these things. I'm going to, um, you, can, you can avoid it this way. Inquire of the Lord. Consciously choose not to listen to your rational mind. And when in doubt, wait. Wait till you've heard. How many have found that to work? When you wait till you hear, it works out better than when you rush without asking. So here's two words of hope. It's been kind of sober, I get it. Um, God redeemed Israel's mistake through their righteous response. And here's the implications for you and me today. It's not in the text, but it was in Joshua 7. If you repent from those places you've coddled sin or made a false alliance, God will forgive your sin and cleanse you from all of that unrighteousness. It's the promise of the new covenant. It's buried in the text when Achan finally confessed Israel dealt with the sin, God dealt with it, then they had victory. And we know that Christ has paid the price on the cross for your past, present, and future sin, and all we need to do is go to him and ask for forgiveness. But the forgiveness is genuine repentance. We're saying, Lord, I'm tired. I do not want to go this way. No, it's not pleasing. And I'm going to make a choice to go this way so I repent and I turn the other direction. Metanoia is the word. I change my mind about this pattern of living and I choose to do this. But Lord, before I take the first step, I'm going to rely on your grace to enable me to do what I cannot do and could not do before in the past. And the only way I can walk in righteousness is you give it to me. Did you see the close of Isaiah 54, 16 and following was that the grace for righteousness came from the Lord. So we repent. The second thing we do is we don't disobey in our response with another evil. Well, since you snub me, I'm gonna snub you. Since I'm getting the silent treatment, you'll get the silent treatment. Said so you do, Since you did that, I'm gonna yell at you and belittle you. <laughs> I mean, you feel those temptations, right? Don't do it. Israel actually honored the covenant they'd made. Now, this is sober. What if you married somebody that was not a believer and you 
it's a, it's a covenant you shouldn't have made, but you made it. Should you actually leave that or should you deal with honoring that covenant? First Corinthians 7 is gonna talk about this. You honor the covenant. There are exceptions to some of this, but typically, like here's, here's the way it's more subtle. Most of you are not doing big things, but it could be this. The enemy says, you know what I'm gonna do? Because I know that they're really called this year. It's a year of restoration and they're gonna be restored in their hearts. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna offer 10 good things to do and I'm getting, getting them so busy they'll never get that restoration they need. And so you make a covenant with 10 things and you get busy with that. Well, you actually need to be a man or woman of your word. You fulfill those commitments, but you learn from it and say, I'll inquire of you next time and I won't overcommit myself when the agenda of the word for the year is actually this, I won't do that. It's usually that, that kind of subtle. Not too overt. Thirdly, honor God by keeping your word. And there are exceptions. If you are in abusive relationship. The scripture gives us some ways out. If you, you've got a spouse that's committed adultery, there are certain things. And you can actually appeal to the Lord and say, Lord, I need out of this situation. I've made a commitment and covenant and watch and see what God does. I remember I was invited into a business when I first got out of college that was really attractive. I had no job. I was unemployed for nine months. And you know how that is. It's just eats at you and you had no money, $400 in debt, no money in the bank account. And I was offered a, a partnership in a business, but the guy was doing things that weren't quite ethical. And I just had to say, no, I can't do it. I can't make a covenant with you. It was, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever in that business setting. And that really hurt them. It hurt my pocketbook even more, but God provided and it was a baseline for righteousness in the job. I've, I've almost gotten fired several times. I remember I was asked to do something when I was working at the bank that was a, a lying. They'd asked me to lie. I said, I can't do that. I said, you can fire me. You can take me off the account, but I will not do that. And they backed off. This was my boss. And um, they were really angry about it, but they backed off and I got the account without lying. And it was the top account in the, the bank at the time. But I honored God, so God honored me. So I'm just encouraging you, there's choices always before you on this. Honor God by keeping your word, the word that you've made to the Lord. And if you've made a covenant, stick with it. I want to say this by word of hope. Also, the area in which you've been deceived and the false commitments you've made can become a servant for the Lord's purposes. Do you see what happened to the Gibeonites? What if you made a covenant and suddenly it begins to serve your ministry? Let's just take, you made a covenant with drug and alcoholism. You got delivered of it and now you have a ministry helping those people get out of drug and alcoholism. That's called making them woodcutters and water carriers for the house of the Lord. Or maybe you made a covenant with anger and it was just part of you and then suddenly you work with people that are getting, dealing with their anger issues because God wants to redeem. It's okay, they're just playing back there. Hang with me, we're almost there. Do you feel hope with that? How many realize your brokenness can become the path for your greatest ministry in the future if you make it serve the Lord? Boy, that's a good word there. And then God's mercy honors those who fear him, overlooking the deception, lifestyle, and motives they have for seeking. Do you notice Rahab got in the kingdom by deception? Jacob deceived his brother of the birthright and became the favored line. Tamar acts like a temple prostitute and Judah commits sin with her and yet she's in the lineage of Christ. The Gibeonites like deceive and guess what? They become a priestly city and the ark stays in Kiriath Jerem for a number of years until David brings it into Jerusalem. So God can redeem those that fear the Lord even though their motives are not good. 
Let's stand. Let me pray for us. Ha. Huh. You guys breathing you okay? It's been an interesting to go through this book because it's been so like in our face, so to speak. I just want to say this. This is a great opportunity for those listening, watching. If you don't know Christ, a great time to do that. Just say, Jesus, thank you that you're the son of God, that you forgive my sins, and I want you in my life. I'm inviting you to crash in, take over. I give my life to you. Will you come rescue me from my waywardness? I don't want to be judged, but I want to be part of the people of God. Will you take me, Jesus? And he will. It's by faith you receive that and the gift of life, and his Holy Spirit will come and live inside you and put his cause you to walk in righteousness and impute the things of Christ to you. So I just bless you if you've made that decision. Um, The second would be this. um, If you've been defrauded or deceived or betrayed, I felt like today the Lord actually wants to break off the shame, the pain, and the remorse that you carry from that broken situation. A lot of you have had covenants that have been broken. You may have had a spouse walk out on you. You've been deceived in business. You've been deceived in another way. Um, There's been a betrayal of some kind. And I just felt like the Lord said, today is a day of freedom. I have freedom for my people to actually have those things break off. It could be generational. It could be a pattern that's happened in your own life. It could be through from a business, it could be from a, in any situation. I just felt like the Lord wants to deal with that. So I'm gonna open up the front in a minute for that, for those of you that want specific prayer. But I'm just gonna invite any of you, right where you are, watching, online, uh, listening, to just raise your hands and say, okay, Lord, that's me. I need that betrayal. I need that deception. I need that offense that I'm carrying in my heart, that unforgiveness, that pain broken off my life. So Holy Spirit, would you just come brood over your people? Whoa, for those that have had this injustice committed to them. I thank you that there is grace to break that deception, betrayal off in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you'd walk through the room and literally break that off in Jesus' name. I I don't usually do this, but I'm gonna clap. I feel like when I clap, there's gonna be a breaking off of some of that stuff. So Lord, I just, right now in Jesus' name, I say, go. I break those things that have kept them back, that betrayal, that denial, that deception, those things that have held your people back. We break it by the blood of Jesus. We say it shall no longer affect their identity their sense of shame, their sense of brokenness, but they shall walk in freedom. I thank you that your love purchased the answer for their need. Thank you, Jesus.